Okay, so so you can ask me a question while I'm speaking, uh, because it's to and fro. That's the way to go on this interview. I think we can start Rajendra Dada. Yeah, Rajendra Kali can start, yeah. Uh, I, I think first we should introduce ourselves. So may I request uh, Brother Manish to introduce yourself, then Mank. Namaskar, Dr. Ravi Bhatra. Uh, you don't know me, but I know you very, very well. Uh, I've been a great fan of yours, you know, uh, listening to all your lectures in the sector all these years and reading some of your books. Um, so I, I live in Boston. My name is Manish and I live in Boston. And I have been in the U.S. for around 20 plus years. You know, uh, I've been actively involved in the route activities, uh, especially in the last few years, you know, immediately after COVID, uh, in terms of a global study circle that we did and the Prout Now online magazine, which is what is interviewing you uh, today, Ravi Bhattraji. Um, I have been in Anand Margi for around 24 years, uh, you know, when I was back in university in India, in Chennai, that's where I became a Margi. And I'm a train. I'm an engineer by uh, training. So, really look forward to kind of hearing from you on uh, some of the questions that we have. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Thank you. Yeah, my MC, please. Namaskar, uh, Dr. Batra. It's a pleasure to have you uh, with us today. I live in Houston, Texas. Uh, <clears throat> right from my childhood, I had a deep interest in knowing what an <clears throat> economic, an ideal economic system would look like in which every human being is being taken care of. I'm a mechanical engineer. And in fact, during my PhD, which was in the area of control systems, I used to co contemplate modeling the current economic systems, which are not working for humanity. <clears throat> There's this concept in control theory, it's called stability. I, I don't know if you're aware of that. and I wanted uh, to show that the current economic systems are unstable with all the recessions and depressions that we see in the world today. I'm a huge admirer of all your works and I have read some of your books. I'm really looking forward to today's interview. Namaskar. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Namaskar Bhattraji, I'm Rajendra, residing in Jamshedpur, India. And uh, three, since four years after retirement from Tata Steel, I was working with Tata Steel. I am basically a chemical engineer. So I am working with Proud and uh, basically associated with UPIF since four years. And I was really a great admirer of you. Most of your interviews have gone through. And when you had come to Bangalore long back, we were there to receive you. So that day I remember still. Thank you so much. So <laughs> because it's a customary to introduce, so now let, let, let's give a warm welcome to our incredible guest, Dr. Ravi Batra. He's not just any author. He's a star in the world of economics, a respected professor and a writer whose books have hit the big leagues on the New York Times bestseller list. We are thrilled to have him here with us. Dr. Batra, Groundbreaking work has not only shaped economic discourse, but has also provided profound insights into the intricacies of the global economic system. Dr. Batra is the name synonymous with critical thinking and innovative perspectives. With a distinguished career that spans decades, he has authored numerous influential books challenging conventional economic wisdom and offering alternative vision for a more equitable and sustainable world. His dedication to exploring the inter intersection of spirituality, economics, and social justice has earned him international recognition, Dr. Batra's ability to articulate complex economic theories in a comprehensible manner has made him not only an academic force, but also a beacon for those seeking a deeper understanding of the economic forces shaping our world. Dr. Ravi Batra is also known for his work on macroeconomics and international finance. He has authored several books, 
And some of his notable publications are The Great Depression of 1990 and then Surviving Great Depression of 1990, The Downfall of Capitalism and Communism, The Myth of Free Trade, Greenspan's Fraud, The New Golden Age, and End Unemployment Now, How to Eliminate Joblessness, Debt, and Poverty Despite the Congress. So these are just a few examples. Dr. Batra has written extensively on economic issues over the years. For the most up-to-date up list, his publications, you may uh, want to check his official websites, academic profiles, or library database. Today, we have the unique privilege an opportunity engaging in the thought-provoking discussion with Dr. Ravi Batra, where we will explore some key questions around the current global economic scenarios and alternative solutions related to progressive utilization theory and its implications. So without further ado, please join me in extending a warm welcome to Dr. Ravi Batra. Thank you for gracing us uh, with your presence and we eagerly anticipate the wisdom and insights you will share with us today. So my the question is, uh, given the current global challenges such as post-COVID economic aftermaths we are facing, international conflicts, high inflation, and the emergence of nationalist leaders, how do you foresee the situation evolving in the coming years? And do you believe the current leadership thought process has the capacity and capability to effectively address these issues and lead us to this out of this crisis, sir. Well, thank you very much. I guess you're all engineers. Uh, all three of you look, looks like uh, I'm engineers, and I'm an economist by profession. But my <laughs> main interest is spirituality. Long time ago. I met uh, a great philosopher and a spiritual giant in India. His name was Baba Anandamurti. I had never heard of him, but and I was very skeptical. I was a great skeptic before I met him, but after I met him, Immediately, I became a staunch believer of his philosophies and theories. Now, he has <coughs> written something which is very relevant right now, not only to the, to the world economy, but what's going on happening right now all over the world in terms of climate. This is the first month of 2024, January 24th, it is, it is it's now, and we already have seen snowstorms after snowstorms, mostly in the Boston area, New England area. Wind chill is 60 below zero. Who has it? never heard of these things before? There is also a very cold climate in Europe and Canada. So what's the reason for this? Baba had offered a theory a long time ago, written in 1960, yeah, 1959 or 1960, that <coughs> progress is not possible unless there is spirituality in mind. Progress in what should be defined as a positive movement with no side effects, that means with no negative side effects. That's progress. Otherwise, if there is there are some side effects, that may or may not, it may or may not be progress. So he said that most new technology is not progressive in this sense. New technologies lead to comfort, 
lead to a uh, great improvement in life. But what is the why we, 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 why should we call it progress? Because also new technologies lead to negative side effects. Take the take, take for instance the invention of cars, autos or cars. That's one of the biggest inventions in the world. It started in early 1900s, and nobody at that time knew that this, these cars will create incredible pollution all over the world. So it doesn't mean doesn't, that cars should not have been invented or should not have any use, but it tells us that we should look at technology not as an unmixed bless, blessing. When new techniques are introduced, we should also do research on counter technology. So new technology is created, but not a research or no research is done on counter technology to counter the side effects of those techniques. So now all over the world, we have water pollution, drinking water is not easily available, air pollution, not just in countries like India and China, air pollution in India is, is awful. New Delhi is, uh, in the winter especially, is uh, surrounded by smog. China also, Beijing smog is very well known. And there's a lot of pollution all over the world, Russia, Europe, England, but mostly because of these cars. So if cars without, especially without when they are, if they are without a catalytic converter. So if catalytic converter had also been invented when cars were introduced, then we wouldn't have this problem. We wouldn't have this auto pollution. But nobody thinks of counter technologies because they think of technology is an unmixed blessing. No. A counter technology should be introduced right when new technologies are invented. So if a catalytic converter had been uh, used in the cars, Right when they were produced, when they were introduced, we wouldn't have this problem today. Today, we think of computers as, as, as uh, marvelous, amazing. Computers are using, doing tremendous good in the world. But then there are also, there are also a lot of cyber attacks, identity thefts, all these problems are not negative effects of the new technology. So my teacher warned in 1960 that all important technologies should have research done on counter technologies as well. So that's the first message of Prout. Prout is very gives great importance to climate. Climate change and change is now producing incredible harm all over the world. Not just in America or India or China or Europe, etc. all over the world. That's the moral of progressive utilization theory. Progressive utilization theory stands for PROUT. P-R-O from progressive, U from utilization and T from theory together make up Prout. And Prout has to offer original and beneficial ideas in almost every phase of life, in every field of life.
we just talked about the idea of counter technology versus new technology. So how do you implement this idea? Either that it, government should have a department of technological innovation. So that whenever a person, whenever a company wants to introduce a new idea, wants to invent a, a new, a, a wants to implement a new, like, new technology, then the government should conduct research on its possible side effects. But best, best is the company itself should do research on it. But if the company won't do it, then the government will have to do it. Have to see, look at the side effects of new technology. This is like uh, whenever new medicines are invented, they have to be tested first on people. Will these, this medicine have any side effects or not? And the government has a special department to approve a new medicine. So, so the same idea applies now to new technology. Because for sure, any most new technologies are going to cause side effects like pollution, uh, air, air and water pollution and so on. So that's the proudest way of looking at how technology should be introduced, used and introduced. Then throughout economic system also is environmental, environmental friendly, friendly to the environment. Trout does not believe in free trade, for instance. Free trade is one of the biggest polluters in the world. I'm sure you're very surprised to hear that, how free trade itself could, be, could pollute the world. Well, this uh, <clears throat> new technologies cause pollution over land air and water are polluted. Free trade causes pollution over the oceans. So nothing is left. Every place is polluted. Oceans are about, cover about three-fourths of the world and so on. How does free trade cause all this? Pollute all these mm -hmm. oceans. Well, nowadays, there are several countries that import raw materials from other countries. Uh, we have free trade, so importation and export exporting goods is, keeps going up and up. So take for instance China and Japan. They import raw materials in large quantities from Australia, even from the US, India, Africa. So they import huge quantities of raw materials from various nations. Then they convert these raw materials into industrial goods, into, into manufactured products, cars, tractors, uh, all sorts of machines and then export them to the same countries from which they imported these raw materials. Now, wouldn't would it make sense not to import these raw materials, but to convert these raw materials in the very nations that you're going to export to them? Say, in Australia, Australia uh, exports iron ore to China and Japan. If China and Japan were to open, open factories in Australia, then production will still be the same, but pollution will not be created from all this transportation. Transporting, but when you transport the raw materials and then export the end product back to the, those nations, two-way 
pollution occurs. I mean, which is completely unnecessary. If a nation wants to participate in the economy of another nation, then free trade is the worst thing to do because it creates a lot of pollution in the world. That's why oceans are everywhere are polluted. Plastics, uh, oil spills, all these are the result of transportation, which is simply unnecessary. It's not doing anybody any good. Simply, economists believe in free trade. This is not the right thing to do because it also creates a lot of oceanic pollution. So what's the best economic policy in terms of trade? The best economic policy is that we should have free foreign investment, but not free foreign trade. There was an economist from Chicago a long time ago. He wrote an article which showed that free foreign investment and free foreign trade are equivalent in terms of producing the high living standard. So, but he did not, he wrote an article, the article, I think, uh, in, in the 1970s or something like that. But at that time, we did not have this kind of pollution in the world. So we did not take into account the pollution effect resulting from free trade. But if you had free foreign investment, you have avoided all the pollution, oceanic pollution. And you have the same economic benefits. So free foreign trade is much more beneficial than free trade. So Proud does not believe in free trade, but advocates for free foreign investment. That means if a country wants to participate in the economy of the United, United States, Canada, or Canada, or Britain, which import all these uh, manufactured products, all these industrial goods, they should just take their technology and their investment into these countries, use the raw materials available there, and this way we will have no oceanic pollution. So that's why Prabhupada believed not in free trade, but free foreign investment, which has the same effects in raising living standards as free trade, but does not have pollution with it. With it. So, Prout is opposed to the policy of free trade. Now, <clears throat> I'm now going to talk about useless transportation. This importing of raw materials, and then exporting goods made from them to the same, same countries from where the raw materials have come from is simply useless transportation. But useless transportation occurs on land also. Useless transportation. If transportation produces very low, very little economic benefit, but creates a lot of other problems, then it should be minimized. Transportation should be minimized in every country. <clears throat> For instance, take the example of commuting to work. In the United States, in the morning, there is rush hour traffic. In the evening also, there is rush hour traffic, simply because people are commuting to work, using cars just to go to work. So if the government then should encourage 
a policy which allows people to minimize the use for, of cars to go to work. How can we do this? Here, we can use the tax policy very nicely. How? Suppose the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service, the IRS is the uh, organization that collects taxes and distributes also as, uh, in terms of benefits to some people. Suppose the IRS were to give, say, a 10% deduction in taxable income for living very close to your place of work. Say, if you live in, within three miles, three, uh, I, I, I constructed an example last night. Suppose you live within three miles of your place of work. and use public transportation rather than cars. So then you qualify for a 10% deduction uh, from your taxable income. Say your wage is $50,000 a year, 10% of 50,000 is $2,500 deduction. Right now there is no such, such deduction available. So, it's a great incentive for people to live near the place of work. If you are making, say, hundred thousand dollars a year, ten percent of hundred thousand is five thousand dollars. That's a great incentive for reducing your taxable income, and at the same time, the use of public transportation will go up. People will use cars and trains, mostly to go to work. They could easily do that when they live within three to five miles of, of their workplace. So the formula I suggested is, is, is this, a maximum of 10% deduction that should be allowed if you live within three miles of your, place, your work workplace, if you live within five miles of your workplace, give a deduction of 10%, and $5,000 deduction is the maximum, according to this <coughs> idea, then you will not have rush hour traffic in the morning as well as in the evening. Rush hour traffic begins, begins sometimes like 7.30 in the morning and it goes on till at least 9 a.m. In the evening, it, it begins at 4.30 and lasts till 7 a.m. So many accidents occur because during this rush hour. So the idea is that like using the cars for going to, to a workplace is simply useless transportation. Just like importing raw materials from a country and then exporting industrial goods to them is useless transportation in, in the theory of free trade. Commuting to work is useless transportation. Also, so Prout says minimize these uh, these things so that and without sure the, the beautiful part is hardly any money has to be spent in improving in the environment. See nowadays I I found that whenever the government finds a problem, they just pass a law, spend money on it. Like uh, President President Biden passed this infra infra infrastructural structural law or something like that, which will spend uh, 
until I get trillion dollars to improve the climate. You just disallow free trade and offer incentives for people to stay near their workplace. That will take care of half the problem of bad climate, half, half the problem of climate pollution. Isn't it more practical? Very little government spending and problem is solved. So, so, so this useless, uh, this is an example of useless transportation and that should be minimized through tax incentives. Now, well, people will say, well, where would I, where the, the IRS already has huge debt in America, all over the world, the whole world is drowning in debt. Where would the extra money come from to give a deduction to, be, to people? Well, extra money will come from the imposition of new tariffs. Remember, proud is against free trade. Proud more likes to have high tariffs on manufactured goods. They will create, they will produce extra tax taxes, and then, then the IRS could easily give tax incentives to people to minimize this useless transformation, transportation. So, the property is a complete th theory, a complete new idea. Like, we call the idea of IRS giving incentives to people, so if more money is needed, well, tariffs are going to create more money, more taxes, and one idea uses gets government money, the other idea produces government money, problem solved. Okay, so that's an example of useless transportation. So this is regarding a responsible utilization of the resources. Pardon? This is something like responsible utilization of resources. Yeah, okay. That's very good, right? The resources are limited all over the world. Earth has limited resources. There's a lot of poverty everywhere in the world. Even yeah. in the United States, you heard of so many books written on this vanishing middle class. Because why? Why the middle class is going away, is vanishing? Because they are becoming slowly and slowly poorer, poorer. Poverty is rising, not just in Africa and also in high, highly fast growing growth country like America, uh, India. Poverty is going up, rural poverty is very high in India also. So, Prout offers a new theory to eliminate poverty all over the world. In fact, uh, my interest in Prout <coughs> began because Baba, my teacher in India asked me to work on poverty el elimination all over the world. So, what's the cause of poverty? Political corruption. The economists offer, have, have offered lots of theories <clears throat> about why poverty is rising everywhere now, but they don't tackle the idea of political corruption. Here's a theory which Prout offers. Uh, I don't know if you can read this. Can you read this? Uh, the these words are written. W W uh, W P G. I will write in bigger letters. W P G. Can you read this now? Yes, W P G. Yes, yes. W P G. 
WPG stands for Wage Productivity Gap. WPG stands for Wage Productivity Gap. It's defined as uh, let me write it down. Uh, 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 it's, it's defined as labor productivity divided by real wage. I don't know if it, this is my handwriting can be read. Yeah, yeah, we wrote, yes. Okay, WPG, the definition of WPG is yeah. labor productivity divided by real wage. Real wage. Real wage creates purchasing power which is also a word, word introduced by Prout. Purchasing power defines whether the country is poor or rich. Now, <clears throat> the idea is that the WP, this WPG should be as low as, uh, should be as low as possible in every nation. Why? Labor productivity is the main source of aggregate supply. Demand is, I mean, an economy is described by two forces, supply and demand. That's all. If you know supply and demand well, you have, you don't need any other theory. So labor productivity is the main source of supply. Like uh, if you become more productive, if labor, if workers become more productive, they will produce more with the existing technology. So supply will go up. So labor productivity is the main source of supply. The real wage is the main source of demand. So, for supply and, when supply and demand are equal, there is no problem at all in any, any economy. But say WPG or rises, it has been rising fast in the United States since 1973. Can you believe that? Since 1973, labor, uh, this WPG has been rising fast. And no wonder there's incredible problem now in America. And incredible problem of debt. All the economic, economic, uh, Laws have been, all the economic laws governing supply and demand seem to have been abolished in the, the world because this WPG is very high. And in fact, free trade reflects this idea of high WPG, age product productivity, because it, it increases the profits of big companies like Apple. I'm using their computer. I'm not sure using Apple computer and Apple iPhones. All these are produced mostly in China uh, or, or, or Vietnam in foreign countries. Why? Because they have very low wages themselves. China has very low wages in, in there. Vietnam has low wages. So all these low wage products are produced in third world countries. And then they're imported at very low cost. The cost of production will be very low when produced by low wages, low wage labor. And they are sold at very, high, very high prices in America, Canada, England, Europe, etc. So this can, this will then 
companies make huge profits for themselves and their CEOs, but hardly pay anything to workers. Workers are in the point. They, they can't compete with the likes of the workers in China and India. So wages are very low because these workers have to compete with other nations, workforce. But productivity is very high. New, this new technology. Computers, iPhone, they're very important in life now. And so people are ready to pay, they pay very high prices for there in America and Canada. That creates huge profits. And profits then go to CEOs. Some CEOs make billion dollars a year, and if you include all these stock options, etc., they get. But even their salaries, a salary of about 50 to 100 million is very common in America for CEOs and, their, and executives. So this high wage productivity <clears throat> and combined with free trade is the cause of rising poverty in America and Europe and Australia and Canada and so on. When Canada and Australia have, have powerful unions, they counter the effect of uh, free trade Count of the effect of high. Uh, in these countries, WPGs are not so high. But in America, it's amazingly high. And so, the, as a result, the distribution of wealth in the United States is now the worst ever in history. Almost so. 40% of U.S. wealth is in the hands of the CEOs and other wealthy owners of capital. So, Proud's mantra is, people say we should have high taxes on the rich people. That won't work. Extremely wealthy people also control the government. How would they make the government charge high taxes from them? And that won't work. The best, there are two, th two things that can be done. Either make unions very strong, labor unions very strong, but that's also not a good, good uh, policy in the long run because unions become, tend to become corrupt also in the long run. Or the other way is economic democracy. Introduce economic democracy wherever possible. In large companies at least, introduce economic de democracy. Say 51% of shares in any large company that uh, employs, say, 2,000 people or more, 51% of their shares should be in the hands of workers. This is protest, protest uh, economics now. Now these CEOs will make sure that workers are compensated in proportion to their productivity. If not, the CEOs will be all overthrown, will be thrown out. Because the board of directors will be answerable to workers now. If the majority shares, 51% of share is in, the, is in the hands of workers, then the board will be controlled by workers themselves. So, WPG will be automatically low. And low WPG is required to have a flourishing middle class. This war, war on poverty was, start, was started by Lyndon Johnson, the president of America in 1964. Since then, trillions of dollars have been spent on this war. But 
people become are becoming more the, the middle middle class is become becoming poorer and poorer. How do we know that? The middle class can afford right? iPhones, computers, and so many <coughs> industrial goods, but they're all bought in credit. Right. All bought in credit. And these people even can't even pay their student loans in time. How will they? How will their poverty go away? Unless WPG is reasonable and low. Now, recently, uh, labor unions of uh, auto industry went on strike and they could point this out that in the 1960s, the CEO wage was something like 20 to 25% of a worker's average wage. That's how they got some public sympathy, wage increases sharply. Because in, in the 1960s, this CEO wage in auto industry was about 2025. Now, if you look at some figures, the CEO wage around the uh, in the U.S. economy is something like more than 300 times the average wage of the manufacturing work, manufacturing worker. This is an incredible mal distribution of resources, and the main reason for rising poverty in the United States. So as I said, one way would be to strengthen the union and reduce the WPG gap, but that's not a long-term solution. The best thing is to have economic democracy in large companies. This is what Proud recommends. And once there is economic democracy, poverty will go away by itself. We won't need to tax the rich or have the government spend trillions of dollars on poverty removal programs. Their wages will be high because product, their wages will be reflected from their high productivity. And when wages are high, people will be able to afford these things without going into debt. That's the important part. Here, there was this, there's a study done by banking.com. Banking industry has done some of this study. They found that uh, this study has been, they have been doing this study since 2014. And they found that uh, people in America on average have less than $1,000 in their savings account. That defines poverty in America. Less than, have one, less than $1,000 in savings account. Because the wages are so low. As I said, wages have been falling in America since 1973. The wage, manufacturing wages. So, Poverty will go away by itself without taxing the rich or without spending trillions of dollars on poverty reduction. In fact, in, in, in one book I have on end power, um, unemployment, I have produced a graph. In the 1950s, unions were strong. And at that time, Poverty reduction occurred, huge poverty reduction occurred in the United States in the 1950s because of union strength. For the unions now are not strong at all in the United States. And also in the long run, unions also, union corruption also hurts 
on the image of workers. So it's better to have economic democracy. And Proud endorses this economic dem democracy idea to eliminate poverty. Now, <clears throat> you have about $1,000 in your savings account. Something unforeseen happens. Say, your child falls sick or you fall sick. What do you have to do? You, you, you have no savings. You use up all your savings in buying iPhones and computers, etc. But suddenly, there is a need for money. Like you fall sick, there's the $2,000 bill. What do you do? You have to go to a credit card company and borrow money. And credit card rates are incredibly high right now. They were always high. Uh, they used to be around 15% in 2007. 2007 is when the Great Recession occurred. Some people called it the Depression, but the government called it the Great Recession. At that time, the average credit card rate was 15%. Now, that the Fed has been raising interest rates itself, the average credit card rate has jumped to 25%. So, <clears throat> you have a bill of $2,000, health bill, health care bill, or auto bill, your, your car falls, has an accident or an emergency, auto bill, $2,000, you borrow, have to borrow money on your credit card and pay 25% interest. See, the rich people don't have to borrow money. They have huge savings. The poor don't have. They are the ones who borrow money and have to pay these pay interest rates as high as 25%. So 25% interest on a bill of $2,000 will is about $500 you have to pay year after year to the credit card company. You will never get out of debt. The same reason <clears throat> applies to India where credit card rates are as high as 40%. It applies the same reason that applies to Brazil, <clears throat> There, the credit card rates are as high as 100%. The poor will never get out of it. They come out of debt this way. Now, Proud has a solution. Very simple solution. How to reduce these credit card rates? This is in my book, And Unemployment Now. How to eliminate debt and poverty despite Congress. Congress does not allow the, the rich to become less rich. U.S. Congress does not allow the rich to become less rich because they get campaign donations. This is political corruption. Suppose the president decided to take on these credit card companies and did something about this. Very simple, it can be done very simply. In the stock market crash of 1987, Congress passed a law which allowed the F FDIC to open a bankrupt bank for three years. This FDIC, I'm sure you know what uh, FDIC is the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. It insures deposits up to $250,000 per person and has a lot of money saved up itself. It has a $50 billion capital. So suppose the FDIC takes over a bankrupt bank makes it solvent, but does not sell them 
sell the bank to another bank. So right now, the government for, puts a bill of some bank going bankrupt. They make it solvent using their money, then they sell it to some private bank. Why should you do that? It's the government money that made the bank solvent. So keep it open. This is known as bridge bank. Suppose the bridge bank is kept open. Well, let's call it the FDIC bank. Bridge bank is difficult to remember. FDIC bank <coughs> will be easy to remember. So suppose this FDIC bank says to the poor people for paying 25% interest, say, okay, we will charge you a maximum of 10% interest rate or even less if interest rates come down. So if you have a loan of $2,000 to a private company, you will have to pay $500 a year. But if your loan is 10%, has an interest of 10%, then you have to pay $200 bills to the FDIC. Because bills, the credit card interest will come down overnight. If the FDIC tells people, we will charge you, transfer your loan balances to us, we'll charge you a maximum of 10%. Then they will get, they'll pay only to $200. How much is the saving to the poor people behave? See, nowadays credit cards are used for almost, or used for a lot of transactions by the poor and the rich. Even to buy food, they have to use credit cards and they pay 25%. How awful. How painful. So if the FDIC said, okay, we'll charge you 10%, immediately interest rates will fall to 10% because now the bank will, banks will, private banks will have to compete with FDIC. That's why I say, competition, create competition, the general market or make the union strong to eliminate poverty. But my preference is, Create competition. Taxation, taxing the rich will not solve the problem. I don't believe in that. Competition will bring down CEO in incomes. And when incomes are low, current tax system is fine. This, this problem of poverty will take care of itself. So one way to cut poverty in America is this FDA issue open this FDIC bank? And believe me, this can be done in three days by FDIC. At the most, it will take another month so people can transfer their, their loan balances. People can move their money from high interest rates to low interest rates offered by FDIC. So poverty will be cut, cut in half automatically within one month. Maximum one, one month. And it can, be, it can be done all over the world. In Brazil, as I said, the credit card rates can be as high as 100%. Their presidents all also open F, uh, banks like FDIC Bank or Bridge Banks charge 10, 15% as interest rate. Well, poverty will be, will be cut in half almost right away. And then there are other mayors which can also reduce poverty. As I said, WPG, high WPG is the cause of poverty all over the world, rising poverty all over the world. Uh, so now, but there are, now ask me questions, as many questions as you yeah, yeah. You mentioned about economic democracy, uh, you rightly said, which brought advocates. But there, is there growing appetite for the new system like growth or economic democracy? And do we believe that the world is prepared for such shift? See, the economic democracy is an idea whose time has come. People 
are not going to tol tolerate rising poverty everywhere. Paying these credit card rates year after year, year after year, <laughs> with CEOs pay rising year after year, with the help of the government, the CEO. See, the government, okay, how does the government help the CEO? They allow the purchase of one company to take over another company without any government intervention. The U.S. Constitution says that it's the, it's the responsibility of the government to make the economy competitive. There was a law passed in, in the 1890s, antitrust law, which does not allow a company, a large company to take another, another large company without challenge from the government. As an example, in, it, uh, in 1910s or 1920s, there was this company called Standard Oil, which was a huge company. The government broke it up using the antitrust law Use it, just uh, divided it into 16 smaller companies, the oil monopolies disappeared and oil prices came down. So it's the government should be doing these things, uh, using, creating competition in the economy and society. Problem of poverty will disappear and take care of itself. And, and the government, if, if the governments did it all over the world, Brazil, South Africa, uh, Europe. If they cut the, if they created competition, then poverty will not be there. Adam Smith, who economists cite all over the time, but don't follow him. They cite it, they use his good name, but don't follow the, the, his policies of creating competition. So Adam Smith advocated the elimination of monopolies. He did not like, he did not want monopoly capitalism. So if the government followed Adam Smith, touted by monopoly capitalists, poverty will disappear automatically. Very, very quickly, the, the interesting part is, Half of the poverty will vanish in one month. Just reducing the credit card rate from 25% to 10% or less will cut poverty in half in the United States in just one month. And what else do you want? You won't have to spend so much money to reduce poverty. And that's why the title of the book was Ending Unemployment, How to Eliminate Joblessness, Debt, and Poverty. The government doesn't have to have huge debt. See, right now the debt is, in America, I think it's right now around $34 trillion. And one and a half trillion dollars of this debt is simply goes into interest payment. Just imagine how much economic benefit arise, will uh, arrive if private was in place. So one question on uh, credit cards is, uh, do you think a protestic economy will be having uh, this credit card system where people will be living on credit or it will be more of People, uh, people's buying power, as you were saying, purchasing power will be increased. I mean, yeah, people will have more savings hmm. in the power system, and, and if they have high, higher savings, and you have to have to pay some interest rate on the use of credit cards in their own self-interest, they will decide. You know, should we use have a credit card? They may have a credit card, I have a credit card, but I don't borrow money on them. I pay off very quickly. 
I'm, I'm sure so. So it's it's individual decision, not a force force decision to, to have a credit card. I, I don't believe in borrowing money at all, really. Uh, my parents were quite poor in India. They were very poor, they were poor, but never borrowed money. So I also yes. made it a policy point not to buy anything if I have to borrow. Ready. So I have not borrowed money on house, on cars, etc., etc. So this credit card part is not that applicable in India as it is in US because oh, very few have credit cards. To surprise, India's now credit card system is Citibank charges forty percent, and yeah. interest on charges are high. Number of people I am talking. Yeah, no, well, it, it can't be. You know, India is is a rural country. Yeah. For them, credit credit cards are out of no use. But the thing is. India's economy is now linked to credit card rates. Right now. Yeah, Mike, you can ask next question, please. Okay, thank you, uh, Rajendra Dada. So, uh, we wanted to ask a few questions on social inequality and democracy. Uh, the first question on social inequality is, there are several ideological debates going on both in the East and West at the current moment around uh, social, social inequality. In India, we are hearing several political parties talking about caste-based census, supposedly to bridge the gap of social inequality. In the US, there's always a debate about meritocracy versus affirmative action. How does Prout really address the concerns related to social inequality? And the social inequality, well, that 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 that, that may come. That the answer may be the spread of spirituality, because the social inequality comes from people uh, who don't understand what causes happiness, what brings happiness in, to, to 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 mind. Happiness comes to mind only by a staunch belief in God, the cosmic nucleus. A mind, a person has body, mind, and soul. Atheists don't believe in that, but they can also see that there has to be a soul which watches our thoughts. Suppose you go to a department store with mannequins in it. Clothing store has some mannequins in it. And uh, the mannequins are, now they use artificial intelligence, AI. So they can converse with their customers very easily. So you ask the mannequin, who watches, watches your thoughts? The mannequin can't answer this question. If you ask the mannequin, mannequin suppose, okay, uh, what's your name? The mannequin, mannequin will say, okay, my name is uh, Bill or William. Or some other questions about uh, society. But the mannequin can't answer the question, who watches your th thoughts? He doesn't know who watches him. That means there has to be a soul which watches the thoughts. And who owns, owns this idea? This, who, where does the soul come from? Soul comes from the cosmic nucleus. Most entities have a nucleus in them around which the atoms revolve. Like the Earth revolves around the sun, Earth, earthly system works. Same way, the world, the whole universe revolves around the, a cosmic nucleus. The cosmic nucleus 
has infinite power and is infinite strength. So powerful and so strong, it, it's undefinable. We, know, we don't know who, who, what is what the, what the cosmic nucleus, how large it is. It could be a, such a point. But the whole universe revolves around this cosmic nucleus. And the cosmic nucleus also controls our brain. It sits in our cranium and it watches the human mind. So a soul is the reflection of the cosmic nucleus on the human mind and that's what watches our thoughts, which the mannequin does not possess. Mannequin has no soul. But can behave like, with the help of artificial, artificial intelligence, it can behave like a human being. But an artificial intelligence is not a soul. So this uh, social inequality, etc., they can be alleviated, they can be removed by the belief in the cosmic nucleus. And who owns the cosmic nucleus? God. God owns the cosmic nucleus. So the ideas of spirituality, the rational ideas of spirituality, logical ideas of spirituality can take care of social problems. Thank you so much, Dr. Batra. I would let Manishi ask the next question, then I'll go to my uh, question on democracy. Yeah. By the way, I am currently writing a book. It's called The Joy of Innocence. Mm -hmm. The Joy of Innocence. The innocence child. A child has this joy. Yeah. A newborn baby has the joy of innocence. And to get to the joy of innocence, you have to have spirituality. Wonderful. All right, go ahead, another question. Uh, yeah, Dr. Manish. yeah, my question was, in fact, we had a pre-prepared question around poverty, and you did cover a lot of items. And I was going to quote in my question that recently in the New York Times, there was an article on why poverty persists in America. So uh, a lot of the points in that article, I think have already been covered by you, but the article says that, and I quote, that while there has been so much progress made in the US in the last 50 years, which is you know infant mortality rate and deaths from heart disease have fallen roughly by 70%. The average American has gained almost a decade of life. You know, the internet was invented here However, on the problem of poverty, there has been no real improvement, which is clearly what you stated with, along with several solutions that you proposed. My question was, uh, so Sri PR Sarkar advocates guaranteeing the minimum necessities of life. And, you know, that would also eliminate poverty. So is it time to guarantee the minimum requirements in the constitution instead of the minimum wage? And, and can that be done? I mean, along with, you know, some of the detailed proposals that you uh, shared with us today? Yeah, anything, anything uh, progressive can be done if people believe in it. In it. Yeah, so you could uh, enshrine this concept in the Constitution. But practically speaking, If uh, WPG is kept low through competition in companies and through economic democracy, then these minimum guarantees will be automatically satisfied. Wages will be high because they will be reflect, they will reflect labor productivity. And productivity is very high nowadays. Wage gap is rising very fast 
in the economies of China, uh, India, and uh, the, the United States, and it's creating a lot of poverty. When the wage gap through competition comes under control, automatically poverty will disappear. But of course, the idea itself is very good that minimum guarantees should be enshrined in the Constitution itself. Thank you so much, Dr. Patra. <clears throat> so uh, I wanted to uh, ask the next question on democracy. Uh, we are seeing a rise in authoritarian uh, leaders in society today. So how does Sprout really envision democratic governance and what safeguards will be in place to prevent authoritarianism or abuse of power? This uh, question can be answered only not only or even mainly through uh, looking at history. Ever since 1929, um, by the way, the world history since 1929 is quite different from, the, from all those thousands of years of history before. I think 1929 perhaps is the turning point, the one that started off with the Great Depression. We find that every year that ends in number nine, it's just maybe by superstition, but I've found that every year that ended, ends in year nine, foretells what's going to happen in the rest of the coming decade. Like 1929 is a starting point of this idea. 19, in 1929, it was the beginning of the Great Depression, and then, then, the, then the whole world was afflicted with a depressed uh, economic system uh, for the whole decade. All right, let's now look at 1939. That also ends in number nine. In 1939, it started the Second World War. And then the entire wars, and, and the, the war dictated whatever happened during the 1940s. The Depression dictated the events of 1930s, thus the Second World War dictated the events of 1940s. Okay, then we say, okay, what happened in 1949? Did anything big happen in 1949? Well, that's the year of Chinese Revolution. Chinese Revolution transformed China from the, the acquisitive age into the age of warriors. And this is from my book on the downfall of capitalism and communism, by the way. <clears throat> and this is also an idea of how social cycles evolve offered by my teacher, the spiritual giant, uh, Baba Anandamurti. So the age of acquisitors, the age of wealthy acquisitors, the landlords, that's what it was. Feudalism prevailed in China prior, prior to this revolution. So Chinese revolution occurred in 1949 and transformed the nation from the age of uh, feudal landlords to the age of warrior, warriors that now prevails in China. Uh, you mentioned dictatorships in Russia and some other countries. They, they have mostly the age of warriors. Okay, let's now come to 1959. 
what happened in 1959? That's uh, 1959 saw Cuban Revolution. And that dictated the events of the 1960s. Cold War occurred, in the Cold War of 1960s was dictated by the, the start of Cuban Revolution because Khrushchev and other uh, Russian leaders wanted to open a nuclear, open a military base in Cuba. So that guided that and the events of the 1960s. Let's see, now we come to 1969. The great inflation started in 1969. And you see the whole 1970s are, are one of high inflation all over the world. So this idea does not tell you what the, what is the cause of these events, but tells you that the, shows you the fact that, okay, something that happens in the, at the end of the, in the ninth year of the, of the previous decade, dictates events of the next decade. Okay, next comes 1979, yeah, the year of 1979. What happened in 1979? The revolution in Iran. It took the country into priestly regime. By the way, I had predicted this, uh, the revolution in Iran would occur in 1979, and that occurred that time. And even now, Iran is, was, is uh, controlled by priesthood. So then you say, okay, well, let's see what's happened in 1989. Feminism gone. Berlin Wall, exactly. <laughs> In fact, uh, in 1979, I was in Fiesch, where Baba had given a series of lectures. Mm -hmm. And uh, he told me that pretty soon this Berlin Wall will fall. I said, Baba, Baba, how could the wall fall so soon? He said, you yourself has, have predicted that. I, I have predicted the fall of communism, but I guess it will start with the fall of the Berlin Wall now, now that you're saying it. He said that. Said, yes, that's right. It will start with the fall of Berlin, the fall of the Berlin Wall. And it happened in 1989, another year ending in number nine. Okay, what's next now? 1999. In 1999, Bill Clinton was impeached and acquitted also right away. That was the first time it happened in the history of the United States. Impeachment and acquittal at the same time. Also, Greenspan raised interest rates sharply in that year, and then you had a great crash starting in 2000 and 2001. Etc. All right, what happened in 2009? 2009, something very big happened, happened for black people. Barack Obama, the first black president of the United States, was elected that year. That was then. An earth-shaking event in terms of social inequality. And that happened in 2009. So now, what happened in 2019? COVID started that year, end of the end of that year. At the end of, you were mentioning COVID in your action. That started at the end of 2000, uh, at the 
in the year 2019. So, what's happened in 2029? I don't know, but I think it could be economic democracy. It could be proud and economic democracy. That's great. Coming up in 2029. So, the short question that you asked, and I had a very long answer for this. <laughs> well, we are we are enjoying listening to you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. The next anything, uh, Manish. <laughs> okay, uh, Doctor Batra. The next question is on artificial intelligence. So I know you covered that uh, in the uh, talk so far, but my specific question was that just maybe a week back, you know, the IMF director. Kristalina Georgieva had said that AI will impact nearly 40% of all jobs and also worsen inequality. She added that the policymakers should address the troubling trend to prevent the technology from further stoking social tensions. It is crucial for countries to establish comprehensive social safety nets and offer retraining programs for vulnerable workers. In doing so, we can make the AI transition more inclusive, protecting livelihoods and curbing inequality. The question is, uh, today people are having fear from AI and that they will lose their jobs. How will the proud system utilize artificial intelligence for the benefit of its citizens? Well, that I have uh... Direct director is sure right that artificial intelligence will affect jobs. But she continues to believe that the current system of free trade and monopoly capitalism will still prevail. Yes, if 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 the, it affects WPG, that is the wage productivity gap, the workers will be very in a very bad uh, economic situation, but it won't last long. What, what will happen is, see, Proud does not say that new technology is bad. Proud does not say, Proud says, new ideas, keep inventing. Keep using your brain. New and new ideas, keep inventing to make life comfortable. So, in the age of, let's say, artificial intelligence, people would have more time off. Now they are working eight hours a day, maybe. Instead, they will work six hours or five hours. They will have more time off. So, people won't be laid off. But their productivity will be so high that their wages will be, wages will be high. And if proud comes to prevail, say by 2029, people will also turn to spirituality. And then use this extra time to do meditation and get peace of mind. But, but <clears throat> jobs will not adversely affect it. See, new ideas also apply to job creation, to the economy. This is a huge poverty that they, they all these need to be need to go away. And monopoly capitalism is the reason for that. Thank you. I said early, uh, earliest, uh, early in the, in the interview. Proud has thought of all these things. When you need the IRS to give deductions uh, to cut on commuting of poverty, commute, poverty, commuting of transportation, commuting of going to work, well, where, will, where will the new money come from? From tariffs. Mm -hmm. From the elimination of free foreign trade. So how it has solutions for everything that you can think of. 
you rightly said that AI should reduce the working hours and that is called a progressive way of utilizing a technology. Working hours has to reduce. Yeah, but even now, uh, right now people also, yeah. because of COVID, uh, are not working that long. But uh, I, I want to ask one thing, uh, Dr. Batra. What challenges do you anticipate in gaining public acceptance of Prout and its practical I mean, implementation? Well, what challenges do I accept, expect? I don't want to say those. I want to talk about them. Because this is, this Prout talks, the base has to be spiritual. You, I, also, you mentioned many a times. But unless base I mean, the spirituality persists in everyone. It, it, it's, it's a challenge for all of us. I mean, how would they accept it? Look at this one. Like you have this video now on proud, proud ideas. And if this video is watched by people, they will themselves accept economic, economic democracy. This, as the ideas spread, Things right. will change. And people will then become, if, as I said, I'm writing a book on joy of innocence. Won't you want to have a mind that doesn't bug you over small problems? Absolutely. It's that to have an unbugging mind, you have to meditate. And then that gives you the joy of innocence. Now, you know, how does the mind work or the mind not normally work? Say, we have a fight with our co-worker or uh, somewhere. We come home, the fight is long over, but the mind keeps thinking about it. again and again, why did they fight? Mind bugs you. And if you have the joy of innocence, the mind won't bug. The unbugging mind, to get the unbugging mind, permanently, you have to meditate. So you are conveying that we need to propagate economic democracy, spirituality, so that people, yeah. As, so, as this is spread from yeah. your action, from your magazine or from your video, Right. So. Yeah. What's that? Yeah. Yes, yes. Continue, yes. please. So, uh, do we continue or, uh, I mean, <laughs> it's almost <laughs> 90 minutes? No, no, uh, I, I think. While I, I was uh, thinking about this, uh, I wrote down the ideas on. Paper here, and I said, You're offering free, free ideas which people can copy. Yeah. That's what the whole purpose is people can copy. <laughs> what difference does it make if I don't make any money at all? God takes care of me. So, in fact, my ideas have been copied again and again. By the way, uh, there was a presidential candidate, a presidential candidate, copied by graphs without attributing them to me. Now, you know, Baba has written in some, one book, he said that if uh, somebody does you harm, and his social status is below you, you may try to just forgive him. But if his social status is above you, don't forgive him. So I filed some lawsuit and this will resolve the matter. So my ideas have been copied, but I don't care. But that, that, that copy the ideas. Now, God take, takes care of us and he will keep taking care of us as long as we 
I'm free to do. We really enjoy your surrender to the Parama Purusha. <laughs> Yeah. I, I think uh, you have already spent a lot of time. My one question coming to my mind, would you share any information about your current projects? Like, are you writing some books currently? Um, I mean, we are able to know about that. Well, at the right time, my book will appear, this new book. And, uh, so when I feel that the time is right, right, uh, and Baba will let me, Baba will let me know when the time is right. <laughs> and the book will appear. Uh, by the way, I will. I would like to have cell phone numbers of you, your cell phone numbers of you, with you three people, so I can come in, communicate further with you later on. Yeah, sure. We we can share with you. Uh, yeah, we'll share. We'll share. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we really enjoyed. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it was a it was a wonderful <laughs> session. It was. Uh, I mean, time just passed like it's more than ninety yeah. minutes now. We didn't realize how time passed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll be sharing with this with everyone and hope. Uh, but we we'll uh, request you that whenever we sometimes you give to us so that we again interact somewhere in the future. <laughs> we love it. Thank yeah. you so. Dr. Ravi Bhattra, have you have you heard about the proudnow.com magazine? So this is like a, a multinational, you know, multilinguistic magazine. So there are a lot of good articles. That's where this video and the experts of this interview will also be shown. So that is another forum. If you know you want to reach out to all the uh, you know uh, margis outside margis, you know, to write something for that. Just to let you know, we have viewership in. Uh, more than you know, twenty plus countries, you know, including of course U.S., India, Europe, New Zealand. So, but please, please do check out uh, the magazine whenever you have time. I know I'm, I'm sure you have a very, very extremely busy schedule, but we have a lot of writers from all over the globe who are uh, kind of you know contributing to this. So, we'll love to have your contributions anytime, okay. you know, uh, mm -hmm. for the magazine as well. This magazine is, is I, I heard about it now, but then uh, there's also a magazine published by Gurukul. I have an article uh, in their uh, last, published, published last year in September, I think, in the, in the article on uh, inflation, what caused this inflation uh, mm -hmm. this, this time. Well, by the way, some of these ideas that I talked about, like the, like the uh, idea of the year ending in nine, is explained in that article in greater detail. So, so you might want to look at that. Now, I, I keep writing whatever comes to mind. I, my, my, this, this was my concern that I, my ideas may be copied by people. Then Baba said, that's what we want. <laughs> that's our goal. That's the point, Baba. Yeah, even if it's copied, it will be, I mean, good for the world, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. What will be our role as Anand Marquis, uh, Dr. Patra, to propagate? So, I mean, we have to let these ideas get copied because we are not in power. We, we don't have a government. We, we can do propagation of uh, Baba's ideas. But ultimately, are we not hoping that someone will take it and implement it? Like you said, all these ideas, either a corporation will do it, you know, the economic democracy, the 50% shares, or... I, I don't know whether the government will, you know, implement those ideas, but someone, either the corporation or the government will implement those ideas because our role does seem to be, uh, I don't know whether I can say it limited to kind of, you know, propagation the ideas in the right platforms and so that people can read it. I, in fact, uh, have been reading a lot of interviews of S. Jaishankar, who is our uh, finance minister. And I, I feel he has read Baba's books because he uses terms like evolution and revolution mm -hmm. in, in the context of, you know, India not getting a seat in the Security Council, yeah, UN Security Council. So 
sometimes I feel some some of these you know politicians they use some terms and some ideas which seem very very similar to what you know we already know as proudists. So anyway, I didn't know whether you have like quick thoughts on that. Well, this means that the protest ideas are slowly spreading. And when they are <clears throat> when they have been, when they are believed by the masses, that's when change will occur. And this right this this rising poverty will bring about a revolution. Because people don't want to see their children starve. You know, as I said, just uh, to buy groceries, you need credit cards, and the interest that you have to pay for the poor is onerous. Uh, so, We should do our work, which is what, which will spread these ideas and then revolutions will take care of it. People will take care of it themselves. Because there's nothing else. What else is there? This IMF, IMF director says the government should do something. These, for, for, that, they, that these jobs are not adversely affected. They want the government. The government has sold the rich. Why would they not do anything? The IMF director believes in the system here. That what there is no new idea in their in their mind. <clears throat> again and again, uh, when this WPG rises. There is unemployment. Unemployment occurs whenever WPG rises. Why? Supply and demand. When WPG rises, supply rises sharply. Demand cannot because wages are low. Purchasing power of people is low. Supply is greater than demand. Now, and then People have to be laid off. When companies can't sell their items, they have to lay off people. Then, you know, the Federal Reserve reduces interest rates. So bankrupt have they become that some countries have been giving ne negative interest rates. Japan, Europe, for a long time, had negative interest rates. And what are the what are the politicians telling people? And what 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 does Federal Reserve is telling people? The Federal Reserve says, borrow money, and then spend it. It doesn't say that when you, when it doesn't say that it says it says we are going to solve the problem of unemployment by reducing interest rates. Which essentially it means people borrow money and spend it, and the governments also borrow money and spend it. If they told the truth, they said, suppose they said, oh, we are going to make you borrow money, make you get into debt, and that will solve the problem of our unemployment. No one will accept it. Now they say, oh, this is monetary policy, this is fiscal policy. Let's accept it quickly. Now there is no opposition to the. But if the, if the truth told them, yes, it will make me borrow money, make my government borrow money, how is that a solution? And one day it will come, one day the time will come when the government cannot borrow any more money. Of course, people can't borrow any more money now, although they are buying things on credit. The government still keeps spending. So these ideas will, will be discarded. Thank you. So, 
Thank you very much. And we will be taking your words that we have to propagate the proud on <laughs> a bar footing. You have seen in one session almost all the Protestant ideas presented in a logical way. Why should we Why do we should have free trade first? It's creating useless transportation. Yeah, yeah. Why should people live near their place of work? Again, creating commutation, commuting to go to work, which is useless transportation. If people, for instance, travel, uh, say, around Christmas and New Year, meet, meet families, and have, that, that's, useless, yeah, that's useful trans trans transportation. But simply going to work using your car, just polluting your own place where you live, that's no useless transportation. And so, proud said, no, get rid of this. Get rid of free retail. So, they will end up. So, when you, when you, when your, your uh, rational and logical ideas spread among people, proud will be established. Thank you very much. And please send me, please send me the video or the, or the place where I can uh, see the video. Okay. Sure, sure. Sure, yeah. Thank you so much for taking the time, uh, Dr. Batra. It was a pleasure listening to you. Okay. Thank you. Namaskar. Send me your cell phone also, so I can communicate some of these extra ideas that I get. Yeah. Sure. Yes, we, we, we would like to do something in the future as well. So, yes, we will be communicating with you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Send me an email. You may have my email number. So, send me your cell phone, my email. Sure. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Namaskar. 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 Ah, Namaskar. So with your permission, we are closing the session. Thank you. Thank you. Namaskar. Namaskar.